Okay. Hello, welcome to the last session of this day, uh, discourse day at CDM Festival. Um, my name is Dahlia. I run the music department at the DAAD Artists in Berlin program, and I am honored and absolutely delighted that I have the pleasure to announce this um, short presentation here, uh, because what you will see now in this next half an hour is um, uh, emerge from a think tank uh, workshop that um, CTM Festival and the DAD uh, program organized together in late November in 2019. We invited about 20 international artists, researchers, um, developers who are engaging with um, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, and just basically locked them for two days in our gallery uh, with no uh, public intervention, no public presentation just to let them exchange and uh, think and reflect on artificial intelligence um, without any pressure to, um, to generate any output. And even more, I am absolutely happy that something evolved from this session. Um, it was a really inspiring and intense weekend and these three uh, decided to work um, uh, further and to collaborate and to exchange. And this is uh, what came out now. Um, because we just have a, a very short time, I won't introduce the full bios because obviously all three of them um, already did so many things. And if I would like, repeat that now, we would lose the first 10 minutes. But it's Helena Nikonole, media artist, curator, educator from Russia, Wesley Goatley, uh, also a re researcher and media artist. and. I want to add that uh, he will play live tomorrow evening at Berghain, so you shouldn't miss that one. And Marco Donnarama, also a media artist and researcher and a long-standing contributor to CDM Festival. Welcome, and I'm excited what we will hear now. Thanks, Dahlia, um, and thanks to CTM for having us. Um, so as Dahlia said, this is an output from a conversation, a series of conversations that we had in November between ourselves and a, a number of other people. And this is, what we're gonna talk about today is just uh, an element of the outputs of those discussions. And it's really the whole point of why we wanted to bring this in front of CTM and in front of a, a wide range of people uh, here was not to finish a conversation, but to hopefully encourage a broader engagement with this particular topic. Um, so this is what we want to be talking about. So we've set up this uh, crypt pad that is a shared document with a series, an ongoing series of points, reflections, questions around what it is to be, to consider yourself a, a critical artist, somebody who's engaged with, um, you know, a, poli a political impetus behind their practice with the technologies and tools that are called AI or machine learning or neural networks, however those are being framed uh, in the particular domains you're working in. And so we're very interested in this topic to try to bring together um, some of these reflections that we had, these kind of wide-ranging discussions, into a document which is shareable, editable, and crucially can be contributed to by external people. Um, and this document really is explicitly not meant to be a guidebook for how you're supposed to do this work. It is in fact just a document of this ongoing cultural discussion that's happening both with practitioners and outside of practice um, regarding our relationship to artificial intelligence and machine learning. So just to introduce us a uh, small amount, um, um, I'm Wesley Goatley, I do, the, the top three works uh, are, are just a, a quick overview of the sort of things I do. I work with um, the machinic voice, critiquing uh, AI's, uh, AI as voice assistant, using machine learning technologies to critique and explore the politicization of the color green, particularly in, in, um, in policy contexts, and also AI as a supernatural predictive technology. I'm making heavily, heavy critiques of that with this work. Um, and Marco and Helena are just going to quickly talk about their work as well in this context. 
Um, my name is Helena Nicanale, um, and uh, in my works I explore uh, topics like uh, privacy and surveillance. Uh, like uh, the uh, the first picture is uh, from my project Deus Ex Machina, uh, which you could see the previous CTM exhibition. And um, uh, the other uh, field of interest is uh, semiotics and biosemiotics especially. Uh, like in my uh, bird language project where I used artificial intelligence to train it uh, on bird uh, science uh, and to, to develop uh, bird human uh, AI uh, machine learning translator. And uh, I also work as a curator, and uh, I curator, uh, curated uh, an exhibition, machine, uh, Learning Machines, uh, which opened in Moscow in December. And, uh, and at this exhibition, I also implemented this uh, critical and ethical approach. So yeah, I'm Marco Donnarumma, and I do those weird objects in the middle. Um, no, I work mostly as a, across contemporary performance, computer music, and media art. And then the uh, latest cycle of works that is pictured there is um, focused specifically uh, on the relation between body, body politics. So, you know how politicians seize the body, but how whole society understands the body. And artificial intelligence as it is embodied with robotics and algorithm. Um, so I think it's nice we have all these all different perspectives here that also allow us to elaborate a bit uh, as we're going to do now on these different aspects of this document we're working on. So this is one of the first kind of conceits that we want to jump in with is that there is no such thing as artificial intelligence, right? We've not invented artificial intelligence. We, don't, we can't even agree necessarily uh, what intelligence itself is. So the idea that we can create an artificial version um, is a fallacy. But this is a very powerful marketing slogan right now. And this is one of the things that started off our conversation around this topic. And this is why um, us as practitioners uh, feel an impetus in this space is because when you make work, when you contribute to ongoing cultural discourses as you do when you produce things and put them out in the world, you kind of have an opportunity to either um, reinforce a discourse that already exists, particularly, you know, and sometimes you don't want to do that when that discourse is enacted by people in positions of power that you would rather critique rather than support. Um, but you also have the opportunity to push back and introduce new discourses that challenge the existing hegemonic views and instead presents new ways of doing it. You know, this might be one of the definitions of, of how some people feel about critical art as a practice in general. So what we're going to do is just pick out a few topics from that are already in the document that we've been putting together. Um, just to, to give you a little taster, really, of the sort of approaches we're thinking about and the topics we're kind of engaged in in this from our different disciplinary perspectives. And this is a very much a document that comes from multiple situated views. You know, we are different practitioners, we have different perspectives, and we relish that. And we're not trying to make, again, a homogenized, um, codified manifesto of what you should do. We're instead trying to document this ongoing discourse. Um, so, you want to start us off, Helena? Uh, yes, and um, uh, these technologies uh, actually they are highly resource intensive, so they're developed by um, uh, by tech companies and uh, scientific institutes which are sponsored by states, and many states, uh, as we know, develop their own uh, national AI strategies. And if uh, we talk about big tech companies, uh, this is uh, kind of obvious because they're driven by money and uh, uh, like practical reasons. But if you talk about scientific research, maybe it's not so obvious sometimes because uh, scientists, they, uh, they do believe that they, uh, they're doing research uh, for the benefits of humanity in many cases. And, um, but uh, for me, uh, the, the main difference between artistic and scientific approach that artists uh, should be, f from my point of view, artists should be critical. Uh, because uh, let me let me uh, make an example from my uh, educational practice. Uh, I teach in technical university, and um, I, I teach this course uh, neural networks in arts for computer scientists. And when I showed my students this project, the normalizing machine. Uh, 
uh, basically in this project, artists, they uh, created this uh, machine learning model and they invited visitors of the show to uh, choose between two pictures of people who is more normal. And then uh, people, that basically they were collecting the data set to train the model and then this model could decide uh, how normal the person is. And for my students, when I show this project for the first time, uh, for them, like, uh, there is no question because they say, it's obvious. If we have some uh, data set, we can create some model. If we have this model, then we can decide who is normal and who is not. And uh, this is like from computer science uh, community. <laughs> for them, there's no problem. And then it was the starting point for this big conversation about ethics. And uh, we started to talk that basically it's like uh, fascism using machine learning. And uh, we started this uh, big conversation on uh, how, what is the difference betwe between art and science and why artists should be critical and maybe, uh, maybe scientists also should implement this ethical part in their uh, view. So there is this point of, of being critical that, that Maybe we can elaborate a little bit, so why an artist should be critical. Uh, Elena already started pointing us towards uh, a possible motivation. Um, I'm, I'm gonna reinforce that by saying, I think it's no big surprise anymore to say today that we live in a regime, you know, uh, it may be a different regime from what is in China or in the US, but Europe, as Europe has also, it's a very peculiar regime that it's based on information technology and our data and so on. You all know this, you know, Brexit and how people is shifting their opinion based on how they interact with algorithms online and so on. So um, it's quite simple. Artists are among the very few categories who have the freedom, I prefer the term responsibility, uh, to push the boundaries of regimes or the border of practices or the ongoing limits of what a technology is supposed to be doing. So being an artist today, living in such a regime and being uncritical, using these tools such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's just a lose, lose situation. There is nothing to gain from it. And uh, it becomes even more problematic when, as an artist, uh, one may use tools that are out there, that are produced by uh, corporations, and use these tools in, in an unreflective, non-reflective, uncritical way, just reinforce that regime by reinforcing the supposed usage of a particular tool. So the problem that Elena has highlighted, for instance, with data, with data sets, it, it's very similar with uh, um, the libraries that Google is providing for all their uh, deep learning and Magenta for music and all this kind of stuff. So the TensorFlow library has been documented, it's been used also in drone warfare uh, territories. And you know, you're gonna say, okay, but also the computer you're using now, it's been used for war. Yes, and you can in fact use a computer to do this kind of things and to counter that kind of uh, regime of information and of practices. So you can do the same with the code. If you don't do it, you're just helping them out. That's very simple. Um, and I think what pushes us to be here today doing this, uh, it's a very specific political, social political situation that we are living in. Uh, which also include the environment in between. Uh, that's another big topic. But it is certainly a time to be speaking and taking a stand. Yeah, and just to, to build on that slightly, this is one of the points lifted directly from the document, which is about looking at how important our language that we're using to describe these things are. And this kind of gets at what Marco's talking about here, 
where when so often, and you know, we as artists can be guilty of this um, as well as people, out, as, as kind of larger co uh, corporations or government bodies or military bodies can be, of imbuing these technologies with more capacities than they actually have through the language we use to describe them. You know, when um, uh, a, 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 some, some, a GitHub extracted a bunch of code is described as being, say, an author of an artwork, or as described as thinking, learning, seeing, knowing. These are all metaphorical terms, because obviously we know that these systems don't actually know, but neither do they think nor see in a technical sense. And to kind of critique that kind of easy use of that language is an important step because when we describe what we do and the tools that we use using that language, we're actually reinforcing the authority that these tools have out in the world. One of those, some examples of that authority is when people build tools at very high levels and distribute them similarly at very high levels that claim to be able to do things like tell what ethnicity you are based on a picture of your face, tell what sexual um, orientation you are based on a picture of your face, extract whether or not you're a Muslim, for example, based on a picture of your face. You know, the faith that those um, technologies can do these almost supernatural feats is partially wrapped up in this language, you know, the language that imbues them with a form of power which they do not have. And so starting to pull back from using that language and being more critical about how we describe both our tools and our artworks and what's produced through it, I think can be seen as a critical act. I think specifically this is important because at the moment when the ongoing discussion around AI is getting getting kind of leached onto by um, arts organizations and wider cultural spaces. A friend of mine was joking yesterday about how he was, he's a, a visual artist and he said, I'm just, this year I'm going to bolt the word AI onto my artwork so I can make a lot more money in 2020, which I think a lot of people can identify with. Um, that, it, that because there's so much kind of hype and attention, it becomes even more important to have these critical discourses, I feel, because inevitably, whatever else your artwork is about, at a time like this, when any artwork that in publicly discusses AI in its use or as a feature of it, you're also making artwork that is about AI, because it's contributing to this ongoing discussion about AI, and that's where our responsibility lies, to be actively contributing towards that. Because even if you don't feel that your artwork is in any way kind of like critiquing the notion of AI out in the world, it is really um, adding to this ongoing discourse. And I feel that if you care about this, about um, presenting a, a perspective on these tools that kind of takes away the power for them of people to use them in these exploitative ways I was just talking about, being very critical and rigorous about the language that you use should be kind of like one small step that we can all do towards kind of countering some of that work. Uh, let me elaborate a bit about some specific uh, topics like uh, agency of machine learning and um, uh, some specific uh, questions about these tools. Uh, actually, we will not agree with guys about agency, uh, but I think it's also great because uh, we are here to raise a discussion and uh, this is good that we are not agree at some points. And uh, for me, uh, this is really important to emphasize that uh, machine learning uh, has some specific uh, nature or let's call it agency uh, because it also when we use it uh, it also kind of influence on us so and for me this is also important point and uh, also in contrast scientists never think about tools they use in uh, this way so they never think about agency of AI and they never think about it critically and so they um, uh, they never think about this influence on research which, which these uh, machine learning tools has. And uh, also, they usually think that they're doing pure research. So, uh, and they don't think about uh, some specific things like, uh, uh, is this data set which I use uh, was collected uh, ethically? And uh, as an example, I want to talk about this project by Adam Harvey, Megapixels. Uh, he did a 
big research about uh, data sets uh, collected by uh, scientific institutes. And he figured out that many of these data sets were collected not ethically, many of these data sets were collected in public spaces through IP cameras, and um, by, by people that, uh, who didn't know uh, that pictures were taken, uh, so pictures were taken without any uh, consent. And um, also what is important when we talk about this difference between artistic approach and scientific uh, approach is that uh, engineers and scientists, they always use uh, technology, let's say, properly and for some uh, practical reasons. And uh, as artists, we always uh, have this tendency to kind of disrupt technology, to break it, to uh, hack it, to reveal this, uh, this specific aesthetics, which is also a part of this uh, machine learning agency. So this, this leads us also to, um, to another point, uh, which is convenience. So you know, we're here doing this guerrilla intervention, trying to put out this prophecy about the world being bad and AI being bad and so on. Okay, like, hold on. Like, the, the, there, are, there are also easier things that one can do to, to subvert the inertia that we are living in in this time. So, avoiding what seems to be most convenient in terms of which tools we are using, it's an extremely useful step, for instance. Um, so, you know, like painters in the Renaissance uh, or before, they would get known for the colors they would use. They would make their own colors and they would make them so vivid or so particular that they are still remembered today for that. So why artists today working with code should take libraries produced by a bunch of corporates officers in a studio in Silicon Valley. Why do you have to all use the same thing? Where is the originality? Now, it is convenient. Of course it is. You download the library, it's been done for a certain purpose, you just reload it with another dot set. Who knows where the dot set is coming from? And then you got to work. Okay, that's cool. But maybe you can do a step forward and after it, you use those libraries, you can understand how those libraries come because there is open source code that is where uh, those libraries come from. You can, you can build your own libraries. You can hook up with scientists. Um, you can create your own network and your own narrative around this issue of, of, of machine learning, how it can be used and so on. And uh, another thing which I think is important is also uh, open our eyes and realize that the corporate influence in, in the life of artists and in the social networks that they construct, uh, it's, it's already quite strong. So just to make a very simple example, uh, there is a, a funding from the Senate, which many of you, if you live in Berlin, knows, which, which provides uh, like 8,000 euro for almost a, a year of research for an individual artist. Google has residencies of three months that they give you 10,000 euro. <laughs> so you see already there, they, yeah, you, you may think, oh wow, that's super cool, yeah, but think also why they're doing that. And think also what are the implications of providing to artists more than what the state is offering. The corporation is doing something there. The corporation exists to make money, that's the only purpose, not to make art. We artists exist to make art. So everything they do, they have an interest and, and they are, infiltrating the artistic society that we constructed until now with very specific strategies, means, and tools. And being critical about those tools is something that comes up um, a great deal in the document. Um, so like I said, this is, you know, these are just some of the kind of perspectives that we've had in doing the work we've been doing with these tools in the discussions we've had both um, as us as a, as a small group, but also in our own um, creative ecologies. Um, and specifically, what we wanted to do is produce something that allows for much more than just our voices to be present. Um, and so you're the first people to see this URL, um, which is the link to the viewable document. Um, 
and in that there is a little uh, point about if you want to have editing rights to just drop us an email um, because there's a, a separate link for editing because otherwise if we just make it free editing it's going to be deleted in about an hour by somebody who thinks they're funny because that's the internet you know it's how it goes um, and um, but what but we're really interested in getting as many voices as possible, again, not to codify this idea of what it, it should be, but really to have a document somewhere that revolves around a lot of people's different concerns, feelings, um, intimate understandings of these technologies and how we're using them in our practices. Um, what we would like to do now is we, we kind of blasted through this because we were hoping to have as much time for questions or thoughts on the topic of, of what we've been talking about as possible from you all. But thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation and also for opening the document for everyone. I think um, that's an important step and I'm really curious what will emerge from that. So we have five minutes for questions still. So if there are comments or questions, there's one. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks you all guys for your and girls for your initiative. Um, and thanks for framing the manifesto as a documentation of research you do. It's something which is not usually considered how manifestos work, <laughs> so it's very nice. Uh, I'm quite interested in um, like the sort of bubble in which we fall into because we discuss all these interesting topics in a very uh, small community, to be honest. And like this resonates with Helena's work on Bohr's language. I am also coming from Russia. And uh, in Russia, there is like a tendency people of power who have the leverage, they call it, they speak in their bird's language. So we are here like speaking something who like people with leverage don't care. So this could be really nice to also think on the ways to uh, spread the word and communicate it to a broad audience, which is really, really important. Yeah would be nice to somehow also uh, uh, collectively uh, think on these lines as well. Yeah, I think that's, that is really important. I mean, I've been, certainly the, the small parts I've been contributing to this, I've been very aware of what language I'm using, you know, as I am whenever I'm writing anything down for as broad an audience as possible. I think what's nice about the document so far is it actually seems to be something that could be read both by practitioners and non-practitioners. And in fact, one of the, some of the best conversations I had from the um, Dad Gallery workshop that we were all participated in was with computer scientists who were coming from a completely different discipline. Um, what was the, um, um, I've now, her name's totally yeah, forgotten. Natalia Sobelev. Natalia, yeah, who was wonderful and like came out with such um, vivid critical discourses from, you know, speaking from a computer science perspective and that's one of the things that made us realize there was actually a lot of gains and similar uh, trajectories that were desired by both computer scientists and critical artists in this context. So that broadness is something that we're really interested in. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. I think that you framed uh, the most important things about uh, AI pretty well. But I would like to critique a bit and also maybe ask you something. Uh, you said that uh, scientists and researchers are actually the, on the evil side of this. But I would say that actually there's a rising um, a wave in academia, but also uh, in um, people working in companies. For example, uh, Google employees rising against uh, Google doing uh, welfare or um, collaborating with ICE in uh, the US. At the moment, for example, there's a really uh, important conference in Barcelona, fa Fairness, Accountability and Transparency, where actually computer scientists and social scientists work together you know, to kind of uh, investigate uh, and be critical about uh, AI. And I think that it's really important, especially nowadays, to be very inter- and multidisciplinary. So we kind of all uh, get out of our own circles. So both artists, computer scientists, social scientists, but yeah, also engineers working at companies can actually maybe do uh, something together. And I really like that you are opening this document. So I think you can um, actually hear different voices. Uh, so. Thank you. 
Thanks. Well, actually, I, I didn't say that uh, scientists on the evil side. I just uh, made some example. But uh, many scientists with whom I work uh, on my project, they are really uh, super aware about things we talked. So it's uh, like not about all scientists, but many of them, they, they didn't think about topics. So I think there are some communities which are interested to collaborate with artists. Maybe it's some uh, specific people. Yeah, that I wanted to say, um, I mean, you, you surely got a point there. Um, one of the main aim of, of what we're doing with this document and this talk is, is to speak to artists specifically. Because at least for us personally, uh, there is a huge lack of reflection on the usage of these tools from artists, curators, like and a, a lot of us. And so we, we're doing it for our community, if you want. Um, on the other hand, I agree with you that there is a rising interest in, in the ethics of AI in general, from scientists, from workers at, at, at corporations and so on. But that also has a very weird history. Um, so you, you maybe know that the director of the MIT that was now uh, involved with the Jeffrey Epstein stuff. So he he's the one who actually started the AI ethics uh, in the academia. One of the of those that started it, and he started it for a very specific interest. Now I'm, I'm not going to get into the detail, and I don't want to say that the whole academic field of AI ethics is bad. That's not true. That's not what I meant. There are very good researchers in there, especially among feminist studies of AI ethics. Those are the ones that are really nailing it. Just wanted to say we need to be careful in all kind of discipline to, to, to keep our eyes open where things are coming from and, and why they are coming from a specific place. And, and then, you know, if we open the eyes together, then we can see much better than also seeing alone. Actually, I hope uh, scientists also will contribute to our document. That's the point. Do you think that there will be a, <coughs> a point in time when we as a society have achieved a certain uh, threshold of uh, AI literacy so that we can actually handle to make art with AI, not about AI? So like a threshold um, when the yeah we as humans uh, are done with exploring the possibilities or is it because of uh, because AI has very specific a very specific nature that this point or this threshold will never be reached um, I think much like any creative medium there will all I don't see that AI is a particularly radically different creative medium than many others we already have um, if you look at the history of computational creativity, for example, a lot of AI, AI art now is just what was being done with Markov chains in the 90s anyway. Um, but I mean, what um, we do culturally um, is ten, ten, uh, at least in a lot of places in the West, I would say, tend to just recycle and revisit in these kind of like chunks of time, come back to certain forms and kind of like revisit them through new historical lenses. Uh, um, and that, for me, is we probably we will there'll be a point where you, no one's interested in talking about AI art, right? Because they'll go, well, I've just seen it all. It's a bunch of gans saying, oh, look what the AI sees. The AI's made this. Blah 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 blah. Everyone will be bored and they'll do something else, and then that will hopefully give a vacuum of space for the people who actually, you know, kind of want to do this work without this kind of intense lens on it, and just want to be playing around with tools because that's what humans do really well is to play around with tools. I'm hoping that that moment will come when actually, like, we don't have to talk about it in such explicit terms. Um, that really we can just be talking about art with digital technologies in a continued way that we do now, but when we're also reflecting back upon combining them with older forms such as performance, for example. So I think that, yeah, hopefully there will be a point where we're just kind of bored, you know, because, but also by that point I also hope there, there is a wide range of very rigorous critical engagements with these tools. And again, that's what we're hoping to contribute to at what might be seen as a, re a relatively early stage in this current hype bubble of AI. This, this actually is another good point. It makes me think of something we didn't mention here, but that emerged during the workshop that we had at Day uh, about 
the historicity or like the history also of, of machine learning uh, that unless you're working with it since 10 years uh, you, or you're just jumping into it, it may be difficult to find out. Um, but that's also very important. Why? All this technology of, of the, they call deep learning is essentially near various type of neural networks techniques that were invented in the 60s, uh, even before some of them. But when they were invented, they were used for a bit, but then people realized they were pretty much useless because they needed lots of computational resource and the ridiculous amount of data that at the time was just stupid to think about. And what happened now, flash forward, is that because all these corporations have made so much money and so much uh, data out of our lives, uh, they have the computational force and the amount of data to use this particular technique of machine learning. And that's why then we have TensorFlow everywhere, hallucinatory dreaming machine everywhere. Like that's because Google uses that algorithm because it's the most efficient for them to make their business. I think it's outrageous. You know, like th there, are, there are so many different ways of doing machine learning. I, wo I work with machine learning for robotics. You know, it's a completely different world. There's so, many, uh, so few people doing that. And all of us work with, with different algorithms in different ways. And, and there is literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ways of using machine learning. Which, to come back to your question, I don't think we, we reached any threshold. We are just looking at the surface from underwater where everybody, all the corporations are above and, and throwing, throwing on stuff on us. We're, we're really nowhere. We're just taking the stuff that is coming. And that's, that's another purpose of this is like, you know, we are artists. Are we creative enough to find other way of using uh, machine learning? More creative, more useful, more interesting, playful. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> this is definitely a conversation that has to be continued and deepened, and it will be continued in the following panel. So thank you at this point um, for presenting this outcome. And we will only um, have a very quick change over of five minutes, so don't run away too far, um, so you don't miss the next panel. Thank you again. <laughs>